afternoon. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Evren Safshe. Um, Evren is an assistant professor of women and gender studies at San Francisco State University across the Bay. She received her PhD uh, from the University of Southern California in sociology in 2011, came to San Francisco State after a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at Northwestern in Chicago. Her areas of interest include gender, sexualities, queer, feminist, and social theory, and globalization and trans transnationality. She is currently working on the book Queer in Translation, Paradoxes of Westernization and Sexual Others in the Turkish Nation. Uh, which traces the translation of Western discourses on non-normative genders and sexualities to the context of contemporary Turkey. Um, it explores concepts such as gender identity, sexual orientation, hate crimes, LGBT rights in Turkey. She also is at work on another book project on sexual practices that were deemed uncivilized by the early Turkish Republic, such as Islamic matrimony, cousins' marriages, and polygamy. Today, she will share with us her research on gender and sexual politics in the current Turkish government uh, in a lecture that is titled Sexual Politics and the Queering of Public Space in the Times of Erdogan. Please join me in welcoming Professor Evren Safshe to Berkeley. Um, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and thank you, Nazar, for this lovely introduction as well as the invite. It's truly lovely being here with all of you at the Center for Middle East Studies. Um, also thanks to Lydia for um, putting together this event and all the work that goes um, into organizing such events all the time. So um, a lot of the ideas, I will say, of the bad um, are pretty fresh. So I will really appreciate anyone who would like to think along with me put pressure on any of the points that I'm making or simply ask for clarifications or the links that need to be made that are not there yet, perhaps. My talk today is on the gender and sexuality politics of the AKP government, the Justice and, um, um, Justice and Development Party that I will use the Turkish abbreviation for, uh, for from now on, AKP. So um, I'm going to be talking about the gender and sexuality politics that the AKP government has been producing and advocating, especially in the last three years in the country. These include prime minister's declarations against abortion and C-sections, his critique of mixed gender student housing in the country, his positioning of his veiled sisters as always under physical attack from secularists, and his cabinet's declarations on homosexuality as an illness, among other things. Prime Minister Erdogan's proclamations on several gender and sexuality related issues have often been interpreted as sort of mere covers for his real political aims and as means to distract public attention from corruption scandals or from laws being passed that consolidate power in the hands of the government as tools to cover up the growing dissent in the country, including ethnic minorities' hunger strikes and other forms of protest, or the misled military maneuvers that took civilians' lives. And I will argue here that this would be a mistake. So to think about gender and sexuality politics as simple covers would be a mistake. These interpretations rely on easy distinctions between the discursive and the material, between what is talked about and what is actually done. And they also rely on easy distinctions between gender sexuality as organizing formations of social life and other formations such as the economy, the military, the state, racial, ethnic, ethnic minoritized groups, and so on and so forth. I will argue that, in fact, AKP government's morality politics are central to their larger project that ties together the social reengineering um, and the physical reengineering of the country. While I will argue for the centrality of gender and sexuality to the Turkish government's morality politics today, I will also show that an exclusive focus on gender and sexuality as forming vectors of morality leads us to unfortunate erasures of racial and sectarian histories of such politics. So let me elaborate on one example I just gave that has resulted in suspicions that the Prime Minister Erdogan is simply trying to shift the national conversation um, and political agenda. On December 28th, uh, 2011, uh, what we call, I guess, like F-16 fighting falcons of the Turkish armed forces killed 34 civilians in the Uludere Roboski district of Turkey in an alleged anti-terrorism air raid. 
uh, actually more than half of the murdered belong to the same family. A heavily Kurdish populated region, Southeast Turkey has been home to many anti-terrorism raids, aerial or otherwise, since 1984 when the Kurdistan, Kurdistan Workers' Party PKK initiated an armed struggle with the Turkish army. Entire Kurdish villages have been displaced um, and forced to migrate and at times burnt at stake for aiding PKK terrorism, right, in addition to the thousands of lives lost in clashes between the PKK and the Turkish armed forces. Uludere air raid, however, happened at a time of, you know, fairly low intensity conflict given the, you know, compared to the history of the entire conflict. And as I mentioned, those who were killed were civilians. Prime Minister Erdogan's initial silence on the issue, as well as his refusal to visit the region to extend his condolences to the families and loved ones of the deceased, escalated the tension and resulted in a number of protests where demonstrators held signs that read, Uludere is murder. Responding to these claims, the Prime Minister declared in a talk he gave in May 2012, so approximately five months after the incident, at the Congress for Justice and Development Party's Women's Branch. So this is a women's sort of branch event. He declared, I see abortion as murder, and I respond to all those who object my statement, including some members of the media. You repeatedly talk about Uludere. I tell you, every abortion is an Uludere. Now, Erdogan's pronatalist politics were no news to Turkish citizens as the Prime Minister had been repeating at seemingly any occasion that he encouraged his citizens to have three children. Um, there had been feminist protests and responses to his call to three children, but an anti-abortion rhetoric was news. At the time, abortion had not been a social or political issue in Turkey since 1983, when it was legalized. And in this particular talk, Erdogan also brought up his conspiracy theories about what sounds like international plans for the downfall of the glorious Turkish Republic, and it's what he called erasure from the world stage. He continued, we have one goal, and that is for this nation to rise above the contemporary civilizations. For this, we need a young, dynamic population. You must know that humans are the building blocks of the economy. If there are people, there is capital. If there are people, there is consumption, there is production. Without people, none of this exists. Therefore, we will work tirelessly to increase the young population. Otherwise, we will enter an era of decline in 2037. Uh, this is the continuation of the same talk where he calls every abortion an oludere. These statements were quickly followed by proposals for legislations that would limit abortions to the first four weeks of pregnancies instead of the ten um, current limit, that is ten weeks. Um, and some changes have been done, though the time that time the period hasn't been changed so far. And they set up a number of feminist responses. The critiques included some media responses to the Prime Minister's declarations that centered on arguments about women's bodily integrity and their right to choose and make decisions about their reproductive capacity. So, you know, arguments you would also hear um, in the US about abortion rights. Others, uh, however, questioned whether the Prime Minister was simply changing the political agenda and bringing up abortion that seemingly had absolutely nothing to do with the Uludere massacre. So uh, I'll give you two quick examples here. Uh, this is an image that was circulating online where um, the words Uludere and Rehanle. Rehanle is another um, south southeast um, region that's heavily Kurdish populated that um, after an explosion where people have blamed the government for not um, having been careful with their politics at the Syrian border. Um, I think 51 people were murdered. And uh, um, up here you see Uludere. So the words are covered by Kurtaj Yasa, which means um, abortion ban. And Rehani is covered by Alkol Yasa, which means alcohol ban. So referring that while these are what's happening, these are the sort of these bans that are being introduced by the prime minister are um, sort of what we talk about um, as if they're the real agenda, whereas the underlying agenda is being sort of like covered up. This is from um, the cover of one of the weekly sort of cartoon magazines um, in Turkey that have you know pretty decent circulation. Um, here you read um, the prime minister changes the national agenda with his declarations about uh, against abortions and C-sections, and then here you see a you know cartoon image of the prime minister that he has a gift box right, um, in his hand that reads, 
um, I got you a new agenda. If you don't like it, there is an sort of exchange card in it. So you can just, so these, these agendas are all exchangeable. They're all the same and they're all to cover up, right? What's happening is the idea. Now the head of Parliament's Health Commission, Cevdet Erdoğan, insisted in an interview in the comparability of Uludere and abortion. He stated, under medical conditions that necessitated, no one is against abortion or C-sections. The Prime Minister has said nothing about those. Some find the Uludere analogy strange. There are armed clashes in Uludere and people who were bombed because they were mistaken as terrorists. In a mother's womb, there's an entirely innocent child. This is even worse than Uludere. I read these statements as fairly straightforward admittances of the way in which the biopolitical state understands its citizens, their bodies, and their labor. While Erdogan's statements about the importance of a healthy and robust population at first might seem in contradiction with the wiping out of 34 lives right, by mistake, Erdogan um, and Foucault come to our rescue. Right? Lives of potential terrorists a subject position assigned by their, merely by their geographical location, right, are not comparable to unborn, in quotes, innocent babies that are always already imagined to be born elsewhere, right? You want to ask, where are these babies born um, that are innocent babies? While the Kurdish southeast of the country has been targeted with death and literal states of exception, biopolitics of life are forced upon citizen subjects who are expected to give birth to docile citizens who will enhance the country's economy and its position on the world stage. This we find not solely in Erdogan's anti-abortion stance and his chance for three children per family, but also in his politics of health. Both the banning of alcohol sales after 10 p.m., which is actually right now uh, being exercised, as well as his personal position vis-a-vis -vis smoking, um, he, which he's very critical of and he doesn't let anyone around him smoke and upon first sight he will confiscate your cigarette pack if you're smoking around him. Um, these have been interpreted uh, by some of the secular public as religiously motivated actions, but Erdogan himself speaks of nothing but a healthy nation when he argues against alcohol and cigarette consumption. Further, Erdogan's statement doesn't declare every abortion is murder, but states every abortion is an oludere. This simultaneously acknowledges the killing that happened in Uludere and renders it to everyday, ordinary violence. Indeed, the decades-long states of exception in the area, anti-terrorism raids, forced migration and displacement of Kurdish citizens, and the ignoring of hunger strikes of Kurdish political prisoners up to its 66th day, which happened only a couple of months prior to the Uludere incident in September and October of 2011, speak to the slow death that has been inflicted upon the bodies of the country's Kurdish citizens, among other uh, minorities. So the older story shows that Erdogan's politics around abortion and around the killing, slow killing or eventful death of Kurdish citizens of the country are products of the same biopolitical ideology that kills and bans in the name of life. And despite some suspicions in the popular media, as well as public forums on the World Wide Web that I mentioned earlier, many others took both the Prime Minister's proclamations about abortion and C-sections, as well as his words undermining the killings that happened in Uldere seriously, walking with banners that stated, abortion is a right, Uldere is a massacre, um, for instance, which was used you know, um, quite often. And here is another example, this is another um, weekly cartoon magazine um, that circulates in Turkey. Oh, did I click something? Okay, good. Um, you see here a young boy running home to his dad from what it seems like a massive bombing of the area outside, um, screaming, Daddy, Daddy, the state is having an abortion again. To which the father replies, that is not abortion, it is Kurdish opening. Now the tur Turkish term for abortion is Kurtaj, which you see right, oh, I think I have a laser, right? Which you see right here. Right, and then Kurt Achilama here is a sort of play on words um, Kurt Achilama, which translates as Kurdish opening, and which refers to a set of legislations the AKP government had engaged in around the summer of 2008. So, you know, three years, no, four years prior to these, three, four years prior to these incidents, that mostly centered around cultural inclusivity of the Kurdish population. For instance, the first Kurdish uh, language official television channel started around that time and there were talks about education reform that would allow 
Kurdish children to access education in their mother tongue. Now, in a country where a deputy has been imprisoned for simply speaking in Kurdish in the parliament as she was being sworn in, these seem significant steps towards a less racist, more inclusive understanding of citizenship. The word choice here is purposeful, the, my word choice, I guess. Um, I say it seemed more inclusive in the same manner I talk about cultural inclusivity in quotation marks to underline this particular understanding of Kurdish rights as merely civil cultural rights of a minority in a diverse country. Right? What good having a Kurdish language television channel would do to thousands of displaced and dispossessed families on a piece of land that's being rendered barely livable is unclear, but there was a lot of liberal and left excitement in the country about these developments. AKP's re-election for a third term in 2011 really shifted their tone, and the Kurdish opening turned into Uludere massacre, and hence the slippage you're seeing here, right? Um, the detainment of thousands of students, academics, journalists of Kurdish descent, or um, those who were known to be supporters of the Kurdish movement in any capacity, under the pretense they were members of the um, of KJK, which is the sort of union of communities. Um, in Kurdistan, that is allegedly the ideological arm of the sort of terrorist PKK. The acknowledgement of what happens in the region as state abortion, right, which is stated in this cartoon, um, and the sarcasm around the easy slippage between Kurdish opening on one hand and state abortion of Kurdish populations on the other speaks to popular understandings that developed about a government that can shift the de definition of what constitutes life and whose lives are worth living. Now, when the government officials make statements that clearly and un undeniably link gender and sexual morality, right, in this case, abortion as both personally cruel towards innocent children and as irresponsible citizenship, and so when, when the link is made between gender sexual, sexual morality and racialized populations so openly, like it was done here, this kind of acknowledgement, right, uh, on part of the population also follows quickly. So, you know, I promise you that I'm going to show you how erasures of racial and ethnic minorities will happen. This is not an example of that because, as you can see, there is popular acknowledgement that gender, sexual politics, and racial politics have a lot to do with each other. But that's, I argue, only because it was stated so obviously um, by the prime minister. Like this slippage was stated so obviously. Now, I will turn to Giza Park uprisings and what I call the queering of public space in the title of the talk in order to show what I find to be, on one hand, an exciting acknowledgement by the citizens of the centrality of gender sexuality politics to neoliberal governance and their refus refusal to be folded into invitations to proper citizenship and moral citizenship on one hand and the unfortunate racial and sectarian erasures that can still happen when there is an ahistorical understanding of the government's morality politics. So, um, Giza Park and queering of public space is the next part of my talk. As some of you might know, Giza Park uprisings constitute the largest public protest against the AKP government in Turkey to date. The protest started on May 27, 2013, as objections to Istanbul's urban renewal project instigated by Turkey's Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan, which would replace Taksim Gezi Park situated at the city center with a shopping mall and with restored Ottoman barracks. The peaceful protests were met with police crackdown, including the burning of the tents of the protesters who were camping on the park grounds to prevent the dozers from removing the trees. While police crackdowns on protests were quite familiar to citizens of Turkey at this point, as well as the use of tear gas and high pressure water hoses, this was the first time protesters refused to disband and leave the park, which inspired many citizens of Turkey all over the country to pour into public squares in protest. The increasing participation in demonstrations led to excessive police violence, which led to larger crowds that not only demonstrated against the demolishing of Gezi Park, but who called the authoritarian and autocratic AKP government to resign because it works, in quotes, not for, but despite its public, as citizens commonly state. Before we turn to, protests, to the protests and how citizens queered public space, let me quickly make a note on how I understand gender and sexuality, because I think it'll help, um, I think, frame the talk. 
I understand gender and sexuality as systems of meaning that work as normalizing mechanisms by distinguishing the morally upright from the morally loose, the normal from the abnormal, and the respectable from the unrespectable subjects. So I'm not so much interested in t taking the categories of women or LGBT for granted, but in understanding how these categories come into being, what role normalizing heteropatriarchal mechanisms play in producing some subjects as right and others as wrong, and what role such distribution then plays in people's life chances, their criminalization, or their distribution onto an unjust labor market. A number of accounts I have had the chance to read or listen to on this topic, and you might have encountered some of them as well, that, that sort of focus on the gender and sexuality issues around Gezi Park protests, um, usually focus on the increased visibility of LGBT subjects during the Gezi Park uprisings, the setting up of an LGBT block in the park that distributed free food and medical supplies to the best of their ability to the protesters, and the reports by LGBT activists, including trans activists, that they have never felt this level of belonging in to the public. I find all of these to be quite important, but I will be focusing on other elements I find in some ways to be you know, a bit more significant, precisely because they do not start out with these distinctions between LGBT and non-LGBT, or I guess straight in quotes, but question the very distinction that is supposed to exist between the morally upright and the morally questionable subjects. This understanding of gender and sexuality ties to the second part of my title, which is sort of the times of Erdogan, um, and hence my use of Erdogan government as a temporal marker. What I call the times of Erdogan refers to a set of discursive mechanisms put forth by the Turkish prime minister to produce a public that properly aligns with sensibilities that he and his governing party have been carefully cultivating. Traditions are being crafted under the pretense of referring to already existing sensibilities of the Turkish public. And I'm not suggesting that conservatism in Turkey is you know, being single-handedly invented by the prime minister by any means. But I'm, what I'm proposing is that the solidification of conservatism as a national quality right, shores up AKP as just the right party to govern Turkey. It naturalizes those qualities in the national body as the ones AKP merely represents and not those that it produces. Or as Elan Siksu so aptly put in The Laugh of Medusa, hold still, we're going to do your portrait so that you can look, begin looking like it right away. AKP's politics are not only about restructuring public spaces, but they're also and very much about painting a portrait of the nation so that the nation can start looking like it right away, which Gezi Park protesters aptly acknowledged and effectively disrupted. Um, I'm going to skip this. I have an example of sort of how the production of particular moralities and sensibilities work um, through using actually the head of the major opposition party and his discourse. Um, who you know speaks very much in the discourse that Erdogan sets up for him, but I'll just say this for the Q&A because I think my talk is already a bit longer than it should be. So let's turn to what about Gezi Park protests work to both recognize and disrupt the discursive matrix Erdogan has been setting up and continues to set up that divides the morally upright from the morally loose, the ordinary citizens from the troublemakers, and his citizens from what he called a handful of drunken plunderers. Now, one of the unintended and very promising outcomes of the scale and systematicity of Erdogan government's morality politics unleashed during the Gezi Park uprisings has been the fact that a large number of citizens have found themselves on the other end of normalizing and minoritizing mechanisms that evoke tropes of respectability and propriety. One significant way in which this has taken place is through the dismissal of the protesters by the prime minister as marginal group lar, which transliterates, marginal transliterates as marginal, but its everyday Turkish use evokes not so much a sense of triviality, but a sense of abnormality, a deviation from mainstream norms and values. Erdogan's positioning of the protesters as a handful of drunk plunderers, and if you've seen any images, I actually didn't bring any because I already have, I think, too many images in, this, in these slides, but um, that their people were not a handful by any means, the protesters across the country. So his positioning of the protesters as a handful of drunk plunderers, his statements about protesters allegedly entering a mosque, 
with shoes and drinking inside, his proclamations that women with headscarves were insulted by demonstrators, as well as, which actually came up very recently in the news, and I'm happy to talk about it during the Q&A, as well as his reference to what he calls his 50%, as he calls his voter base, all served to divide the country into those who lived morally sound lives by the book, his voter base, and those who were morally loose, um, which in Turkish he used the term ahlaksız. Now, Erdogan's lies, I mean outright lies, about protesters insulting the Dolmabahce Mosque were exposed by video footage showing that the mosque had been turned into an infirmary, treating those injured by the tear gas canisters directly shot at them, high pressure water, as well as beatings by the police. And the mosque's imam also, um, you know, basically denied these allegations and was subsequently removed from his post. Uh, other video footage show women with headscarves talking about not being treated with any disrespect at the park. The existence of revolutionary Muslims, so these are all things that disrupt Erdogan's narratives. The existence of revolutionary Muslims, a group that has been quite vocal about AKP government's neoliberal politics before, during, and after Gezi Park protests from an in-faith position also disrupts the prime minister's narratives, situating the AKP government as the immoral for their violent greed, for instance. But what is most important to me is that instead of engaging in a politics of respectability and claiming the space of normalcy as prescribed by the government, the protesters both stated their respect for pious citizens, and I can tell you more about how that happened, and still inhibited the space of the marginal, the immoral, the plunderer, and the drunkard. Chapulju is a term that was used by the Prime Minister and it translates as plunderer, looter to English and ayash was another one which translates as drunkard. Terms repeated by Erdogan to refer to the protesters were taken on by many people involved in the protest and turned into a resistant sort of subjectivity to be proud of. So I'll show you some images. Like now you can see sort of t-shirts and banners that read um, Chapulju, which were really prevalent um, in the country. Here is a um, I think JHP deputy who wore a t-shirt to the parliament um, that reads plunderer. Um, and here is a banner, this was also sort of quite prevalent during the protests where Chirpulju was positioned as an alternative political position. So this banner reads, we are not right wing, we are not left wing, we are Chirpulju, we are Chirpulju. This rejection of moralizing, oh, and then there's one more. So here is um, one of my favorites. Um, there are, uh, these are two women um, wearing headscarves, and the one on the left um, wears a, is carrying a banner that says, AKP, you are intolerable when we are sober. So saying that you, know, you want to ban alcohol, but you are really literally the reason we're drinking in this country. Um, and then the other woman is carrying a banner that was also a very prevalent um, sort of slogan that reads, um, shoulder to shoulder against fascism, so positioning the government as a fascist government. This rejection of moralizing, and so you know, they're not saying we don't drink, you know, alhamdulillah, like, we don't, like they don't engage in this, you know, we don't drink, we don't do any of the things you're blaming us for, they are really occupying the place that Erdogan is pushing them into, but they are really turning the discourse around. So this rejection of moralizing and normalizing discourses, I argue, established a political kinship between Gezi Park protesters and queer activists and feminists in the country who have been for a long time challenging the normalizing mechanisms through evoking discourses of anti-morality. And here are some examples. So this banner reads, Baskı şiddet ahlaksı biz ahlaksızız, which translates as if oppression and violence are morality, we are immoral. And here's another one um, that's a pretty you know, common again, sort of slogan in um, LGBT Pride March, but also many of the feminist uh, marches um, that reads as sort of genel ahlaksız, which I translated as generally immoral, but, but you should know that it's sort of play on words uh, departing from this term genel ahlak, general morality, that operates as a legal term, so it is written in the law, genel ahlak, um, general morality, and has been used for various governmental morality projects including the temporary shutting down of the LGBT Solidarity Association, Lambda Istanbul, for instance, um, uh, as, um, as well as um, actually penalizing a lot of um, trans sex workers. This is also used. So um, 
The embracing of Çöpülcü subject position as encapsulating, encapsulating everyone who was immoral by AKP criteria and who was out on the street targeted by police violence made solidarities possible that were hitherto unimaginable and enabled so thus far privileged citizens understand the arbitrariness of their privilege. A second element that contributed to what I call the sexual politics of Gezi Park was the fact that people were not just protesting the demolishing of Gezi Park and the other neoliberal politics of AKP, despite the fact that that was the starting point, but they were also openly targeting the gender and sexuality politics of the governing party in their slogans. So they brought the gender and sexuality politics as literally relevant to the neoliberal politics of the government to the streets. For instance, various demonstrators carried signs that read, um, Tayyip, would you like three more kids like us? And now you're familiar uh, with what that refers to. Um, these sarcastic slogans, and then there is more. So you see a few more here so that, you know, I'm doing my job as a social scientist and I'm <laughs> bringing a set of data. Um, these sarcastic slogans targeted Erdogan's relentless lectures on the importance of having three children and his pronatalist politics by smartly indicating the unintended consequences of that wish and the impossibility of fully control of people. When Erdogan suggests that women have three children, the irony goes, the last thing he has in mind is that women will have children so that they can take them to anti-government rallies mm -hmm. where they can chant for Erdogan to resign. People chanting Fushizme Karşı Omuz Omuza, for which you've seen a banner um, a couple of slides ago, also recognize the larger authoritarian, autocratic, conservative, pronatalist politics, right, pronatalist fascist politics of the government that merged neoliberal restructuring of public spaces with bans on alcohol sales, urging women to grow the nation's population, etc. So here we have a protesting public that doesn't see the government's sexuality politics as secondary to the neoliberal restructuring of the city or as mere covers, but they recognize the centrality of pronatalist politics to neoliberal, neoliberal governments that happily extract labor out of their populations while they push the service functions of the state increasingly onto the institution of the family and at the same time concentrate and increasingly concentrate and deploy police and military functions. A government that says we will do whatever we want with the city and a government that says we will do whatever we want with your bodies doesn't articulate different projects but interconnected ones. These citizens, I argue, recognize AKP government's larger project that ties together social reengineering and physical reengineering of the country that cultivate values and sensibilities in a public who will happily have three children for Erdogan so that they can grow up to be the cheap labor to build the shopping malls that he's going to own or his family members as well as fund all their salaries in those shopping malls. Scholars of neoliberalism underline that neoliberalism is not simply an economic project but also a cultural project uh, through sort of co-opting uh, some, partially through co-opting identity culture uh, politics and partially by creating an illusionary distinction between economic issues and politics and culture. We witness a merging of the mildly Islamist and neoliberal values with the AKP government, where the moment Erdogan's neoliberal policies were met with resistance, the cultural values that come to rescue are not just those of neoliberalism, so this here is a bit of a difference, such as you know, individual responsibility, diversity, independence, but also biopolitical ones, such as national health, internal and external enemies, and presumably Islamist ones, according to, you know, but, but there are challenges to his interpretation of Islam, that divide the public into the morally upright and the morally loose, according to Erdogan's interpretation of Islam. As I mentioned earlier in the talk, when I say queering of public space, I don't simply refer to the physical and visible coexistence of LGBT subjects with sort of straight people in the park and on the streets, but I mean also, right, besides this disruption of larger tropes of morality and respectability by most of the protesters, I also mean an introduction of queer subcultural elements to the mainstream consciousness, consciousness of the protests. For instance, um, Here's my is going to be my attempt to do like a bad job at translation. So ayol, uh, one of the fabulous untranslatable idioms in Turkish language, is used widely in queer subculture, and it's translate untranslatable partially because um, it doesn't really say anything in particular, but constitutes more of a gesture or an affect of effeminacy and limp wristedness. So while not the correct translation, those of you who are familiar with 
the English term girl with a U, so G-U-R-L, can think of them as sort of comparable. Diran ayol, resist ayol, so like a limp-wristed resistance, um, emerged both as a slogan and a key hashtag during the protests, and I'm not a huge Twitter person, but Twitter was rather large during the protest because that be be became the only way in which people could get any news and a coverage um, of the protests. And Hans was declared today's biggest menace to society by the Prime Minister. So um, Diren Ayol emerged both as a slogan and a key hashtag, and instead of marking the bodies that utter the term as object, it became folded into the fabric of protests and it became a protest attitude and style without becoming necessarily normalized. So here we see, oh this is, okay, so here we see a banner that reads, what is prohibition I all? So it's like, what is prohibition I all, kind of, uh, right? And protesting, this protest governments, the government's authoritarian role and various bans uh, without that they have introduced in a tongue-in-cheek manner. And I find that queer bodies simultaneously mocking and protesting prohibition and reversing the unintelligibility often placed on their lives and on their bodies back onto the authoritarian role is a brilliant example of queering of, of, sort of both of public space and of citizens' relationship to normalizing mechanism, right? So this gesture is, we don't really understand what you mean by prohibition, right? And reverses the unintelligibility. Uh, let me show you one last image uh, that I think speaks perfectly to sort of what I mean by querying of public space, and then I will wrap up. Are we doing okay on time? Mm. Or? Okay. So uh, here we see um, a young male-bodied person featuring facial hair, wearing a fabulous black and silver sequin overalls and high heels, mixed with protester gear, as you can see hopefully, um, that consists of a mask to protect the mouth, and the nose, goggles to protect the eyes, and a helmet, which is not always standard, but it's very handy, to protect the skull from the tear gas canisters that were often shot directly at protesters and injured and killed a number of people. He, she is carrying a banner that reads, Chopulju de Hanum. Madam Chopulju is here, would be the translation of this phrase, but that translation would of course fail to capture the subjectivity that the banner refers to. The slogan gestures to Bohçacı geldi hanım, Madam, the peddler is here, a phrase melodically shouted, those of you who grew up um, in Istanbul in the 70s and 80s, I think, will know this melody, melodically shouted by women who carried various textile products and women's garments in a bundle they carried around in the streets, serving housewives' needs who might not be able to leave their home for various reasons, announcing their arrival in the neighborhood. So now you would go, um, out the window and sort of invite them in if you wanted to look at their stuff. This banner here heralds a different kind of arrival by a new subject who is here to meet a different kind of need. This new protester subject, Chopulju, is hereby not only owned, but also queered. And the queer feminine Chopulju subjectivity embodied by this one protester also emphasizes a lineage of decades of working class women walking the streets every day going in and out of public and private spaces, not belonging to either necessarily, and belonging to both at the same time. In this sense, I argue the slogan also reclaims and queers what constitutes national traditions. Peddler women are a dwindling population, as you can imagine, suggesting that there are different ways to embody and inhabit tra tradition that, than the ways the governing party, AKP, would like us to do. So, um, as I suggested through the talk, so to conclude, AKP's gender and sexuality politics are central to their re-engineering of the public to align with the values they have been cultivating so that their material re-engineering of the country is not only not met with resistance, but with, it's met with appreciation and admiration. And I find it really heartening that the public perceives Erdogan's gender and sexuality politics to be not so separate secondary issues, but to be things that need criticizing right along with their neoliberal restructuring policies and practices. When the government's gender and sexuality politics are articulated clearly in conjunction with the government's racial politics, such as in, such as in the example that I gave you about Uludere and abortion incident, the public is in some ways invited to think about the connections between racial and sexual politics. So in some ways, I'm thankful to Ardon for popularizing the connections between sexuality and race. 
However, there are other incidents where an ahistorical perception of moralizing and otherizing politics can erase racial and sectarian violences of the past. For instance, a piece in the Darsim News Portal reminds us that the first Chapul Jews plunderers of the country were from Darsim. Here are a couple of the news pieces from 1937. The rebellion against the displacement politics of the Turkish state targeting Alevi Kurds and Zazas in the region resulted in the massacre of seven to 10,000 people, but there are, num you know, people estimate some higher numbers too, in 1937 and 38, as well as the forceful relocation of around 3,000 people. I'm not suggesting that therefore the term Turpulju only belongs to Alevis and should not be used by Gezi Park protesters, though there was no acknowledgement of this history as people were sort of um, owning the subjectivity of Chapulju. My caution is rather against a historicizing resistance against brutal governments and against the decontextualized understanding of AKP government's brutalities. If we can situate our rebellions against autocratic authoritarian governments in their proper historical context, not only will we be better equipped as to not engage in racial and sectarian erasures, but we will be able to see and articulate sounder coalitions for rebellions against moralizing and normalizing politics. Thank you.